we continue our study in the book of Ephesians this morning. When the West was being won, hopeful settlers would join onto these things called wagon trains. And they would they would band together and they would head out west in their in their wagons. And these familiar trails that more people would flock to became common and the wagon wheels would begin to form these ruts and people would see where their where their other wagons had gone before them and they would follow these trails. But as more and more people headed out west, these ruts became more and more deep and the rain would rain in there and it would get muddy and it would be difficult for the wagons to get through because of the ruts. And so the, the wiser of the, the folks that drove these wagons would try to take their wagons and put them up off to the side so that their wheels were not down in the ruts and so they wouldn't get bogged down in the mud. And so they would attempt to drive alongside there, but to no avail, the, the wagon wheels would slip that back down in those, in those ruts and it became more and more difficult. And that's actually where we got our metaphor that we use now. I'm just kind of stuck in a rut. That's, that's where we get that from. We need to realize that surrendering control to the new self is a choice. It's, it, it's an action of, of surrender, but it's a, it's a choice on our part to, to surrender. So our goal today is to, to understand, really, the need for us to continually put on the new self by surrendering control to the Holy Spirit. And so if you'll turn with me to the book of Ephesians, we're in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and I'll begin reading in verse 17 in Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance of that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Just to give us some context in what we've been looking at in the book of Ephesians. At the beginning, the Apostle Paul explains that our position in Christ is as a result of God's divine plan. God has a plan, he's executing on that plan, and you and I as believers are part of that plan. And by divine election, he has determined that. Paul continues with this intercessory prayer in the second part of chapter 1, and he's pleading for God to effect a closer relationship with his saints. And then he goes on to explain that we're saved by grace through faith, and that it's a gift from God and not by works. It's not something that we work for or that we earn. And then he continues to explain that the Christian life is about relationships. It's not about just getting into heaven. You know, you and I, oftentimes, we'll, we'll make this whole ordeal about getting into heaven. And that Christianity is about you and I going to heaven. And the Apostle Paul lays waste to that understanding. And he explains very clearly that it's about relationships and it's about having a vibrant relationship with God and with other believers so that God's renown will spread and that the kingdom will grow. He goes on to explain in the same manner that God called the Apostle Paul that you and I are called to a specific calling, something that he has asked you and I to do as believers to fulfill a mission and to represent the kingdom in a ministry. And then he says that we can learn from him how important it is to pray for each other 
And the Apostle Paul offers up an intercessory prayer that's a very nice template for you and I to use in understanding the importance of interceding biblically for each other in the way that we would grow in a deeper relationship and mature spiritually. And then, of course, we learned about unity in the body is absolutely essential and that unity doesn't happen without a relationship. It just doesn't happen. And so we have learned that it's important for you and I to develop relationships with each other and become closer in knowing each other and knowing our, our up, upside and our downside, you see. Last week, we clearly defined that word equip, and we understood the importance of communication in the body of Christ as the teacher or as the shepherd or as the apostle or as the evangelist and those people that have been given those offices. It's essential that we equip the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body, and that communication is absolutely essential in accomplishing that, that very thing. And so it brings us to our text today in chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. And so if you'll look in verse 17 with me, the Apostle Paul uses this word walk. And he uses it in a way, it's, a, it's, it's figurative language, and we have to look at the text and determine what's figurative so we can understand what he's communicating. It's an illustration of a lifestyle. When he says walk in a manner, what he means is a lifestyle. And, and it's the way that we live. And so when he says, I say and testify the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And he explains that they walk in the futility of their minds. What he's talking about is, don't, when we refer to the Gentiles in the first century, he means the unbeliever. Don't live a lifestyle anymore like the unbeliever. And he says the reason why they live that lifestyle is that they live in the futility of of their minds. And were we to go back to Webster's and we would look up that word futility, then we would get similar words like this. The uselessness of their minds, the pointlessness of their minds, the ineffectiveness of their minds, the ineffectuality of their minds, the senselessness of their minds. In other words, don't live a lifestyle like the Gentiles, like the unbeliever, who relies on what they think is right and live in the way they think they should live. Okay? Look at verse 18. He goes on to describe the unbeliever, the unbeliever as being darkened in their understanding. Now that word darkened, again, is it's metaphoric, it's figurative, and what it's describing is the opposite of light, or the opposite of enlightened. You see, you and I are enlightened to the truth. You and I are enlightened to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. He came to earth as the God-man. He lived the perfect life, shed his own blood as a propitiation, as a satisfaction of God's wrath, rose from the dead to prove who he is. He's seated at the right hand of power. He's large and in charge. You see, and we have been enlightened to that truth. But what the Apostle Paul says about the unbeliever is that they are not enlightened. They're living in darkness. They do not know the truth. And so they are in the dark. And he goes on to explain that they are alienated. If you're alien, you're, you're, not, you're not with the group. You're, they're alienated from the life of God. And he says the reason why is because of their ignorance that is in them. Now that word ignorance is not stupidity, it's just a lack of knowledge. They don't understand the truth. They don't know the truth. They have not been enlightened to the truth. And so what the Apostle Paul is saying is, hey, the unbeliever can't help themselves. But you know what he's not, not really saying, but he is saying? You and I can help ourselves. And he goes on to explain in this text that we need to be very deliberate about affecting the way that we should live, our lifestyle, our walk, the way we should walk. No longer walk in the way of people that are unenlightened. No longer walk in the way of people that have become dull. And he goes on and explains that it's due to the hardness of their heart. That's another metaphor. But it's a very specific one, and I want us to return to an Old Testament text that refers to this. So if you will, turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. 
Now in Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophet explains the process of regeneration. And so when the Apostle Paul says, due to their hardness of heart, listen to what the, the book of Ezekiel explains about this, about regeneration, about the, the individual who is no longer hard of heart. Listen to what it says. Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart. A new heart. Now, is, is God referring to just reaching in the chest of a person, pulling out their physical heart and putting a new heart in? No. What he's talking about is removing the hardness of the person's heart. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, little s, I will put in within you. And I will remove the heart of stone. Is stone hard? That's a hardened heart. That's unbelief. Heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit, big S, within you and cause you to walk. Oh, there's that word. Walk. Cause you to live a lifestyle in my statutes, in the way I teach. And be careful to obey my rules. So you see, the Apostle Paul is explaining to his readership, my friends, that the unbeliever cannot help themselves in the way that they walk in their lifestyle. They cannot help themselves because they're hardened of heart. They do not have a new heart. They do not have a new spirit. They are unregenerate. They cannot help themselves. But then he says, in comparison to that, don't live a lifestyle like that anymore. For you and I as believers, we are called to a different life, a different walk, a different lifestyle. And he goes on to explain even more so in verse 19. He says, they have become callous. Another metaphor. If you have a callus, most of us have calluses on our heels. That's where our thickest callus are. It's thick skin. You reach down there and you squeeze that skin. If you pinch the edge of it, you can't really even feel that. You know? They have become callous, unfeeling, you see. They've become heartless. They've become insensitive. Why? Because of the lifestyle. They've become dull. And they've given themselves up to sensuality. They've given themselves up to being carnal, to, be, to, to going with their bodily desires, their physical desires, their fleshly, their animal desires. And you know, most of the time we tie this to, to sexual desires, but that's not limited. And this is not limited to sexual desire, my friends. The physical desires are desiring the things that the eyes see, lusting after the things of this world, desiring things for me and what will better me and that will make me happy and make me feel good, you see. And so he's describing that they've become callous and heartless and unfeeling and they have given themselves up to the desires of what they want. Again, they can't help themselves. They're unregenerate. But you see, the Apostle Paul is writing to the believer and he's saying, don't live like that. They can't help themselves. But you and I can, you see. He goes on and says that they're greedy. What's, what's greed? Wanting more and more and more. Give me more. My friends, more is never enough. No matter how much we get, we'll always want more. You know, there will always be somebody that has just a little bit more. You ever, you ever play, try to play the keeping up with the Joneses game? You see, oh, the Joneses, they... they well, you know, Mr. Jones, he works over there at a, at a place and he makes pretty much the same as I do. They got a new boat. We ought to be able to afford a boat. You know, maybe it's not material things. Maybe, it, maybe it's just about other stuff. Maybe it's the desires of the eye, whatever that is. But they've become greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Not just sexual impurity, but every kind. Okay? And so he's talking about being ravenous and, ins and having an insatiable hunger for the self-indulgence of this world. The self-indulgence of this world. The desires and every thought, every thought is captivated 
by what I can do for me and how I can better me and how I can better mine, you see. This greed, this self-indulgence, materialism, this longing for things, and this defining ourselves by either the things we have or by the things we do. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about how, how do I define myself? Ask myself that question. How do I define Pastor Doug? Do I define myself by the house I live in or by the clothes I wear or the car I drive? Or do I define myself by the, by the job that I hold? Have I, have I done that? How do we define ourselves? We, we, at the end of the day, when we lay down in bed and we think about, insert your name, how do I define myself? Do we define ourselves as a child of God? As a believer? As, as someone who is bought for a price? Who is owned wholly and fully by the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what he's referring to here. They, they, they've gone astray, but they can't help themselves, you see. And he goes on to say, after he's described in great detail here about the unbeliever and their inability to help themselves and their greed and their, their selfishness and their self-centeredness and their self-centric nature. He says in verse, look at verse 20, look what he says. That is not the way you learned Christ. Now that word, if we return to the original language, you know, I'm not going to use Greek in it. But if we return to the original language, that word learned is not limited to a gathering of knowledge. It's more than that. He's, I'll insert this word. That is not the way you were discipled in Christ. That is not the way that you've been shown how to live a life as a believer. That's not the way, he says. So this instruction to learn in such a way as to become a follower of Jesus. You know, that's the first word he said to his, to his disciples. Come follow me. And they just, they just came and followed. Are we a follower? Are we being discipled? Are we discipling? Are we being discipled? That is not the way that you learned Christ. He says, look at verse 21. He goes on and says, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him... In other words, if you if if you are a Christian, if you've been converted and you're being discipled, then you know this to be true. This should just be a refresher because repetition is the mother of learning. So, what is the, the truth? I think this is a rhetorical. What is the truth in Jesus that he that he's talking about? It's the the, the truth, my friends, is the fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, and he rose from the dead to prove who he is, and that those salvific actions are the linchpin, the pinch point of all creation, that act alone is why you and I have access to the throne of God. See, the truth in Jesus is the understanding about his truth and what it means to be a believer and what Jesus did in his salvific actions as Savior and Messiah. Look at verse 22 with me. Now, I'm going to insert that, that discipleship phrase so we get a better perspective. Because he says, this is not the way you learned Christ. So here's what I'm going to insert there. You were discipled to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. You were discipled to put that off. Now, this idea of put off, and we're going to get to put on in just a second, is the, the best way I can describe it is if I were to walk over to my closet, and I'm going to, I'm going to walk away from the microphone for a second here so I won't project. I walk over to my closet here, I open up my closet, I see a jacket, I determine that that jacket is going to match my outfit, I reach in and grab the jacket, and I put it on. That's put on. All right? Now, if I already have a jacket on, and I look at the jacket, and it doesn't match, then I'm going to take this jacket off. It says put off. Put off. So I'm taking the jacket off, I'm hanging it up in the closet. Put off what does not <coughs> match. Are you with me? Put off what does not match Christ. So he says, put off 
your old self, which belongs to your former manner. That's the old nature. That is your old self. That is the unregenerate self. You are a new creation in Christ. You have been made new. All things have become new. Put off that which does not match, my friends. Look at verse 23. And, and I'll insert that phrase again. And you were discipled to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, for those of us that are Bible scene investigators, our Tuesday night folks that are learning how to interpret the Bible, we know that the inductive Bible study method compares like Bible passages so that the Bible can interpret itself. I heard that. Okay, thank you. Turn over to Romans with me. We're going to get some clarity in this phrase here, renewed in the spirit of your minds. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I, the Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The renewing of the spirit of our minds, the renewal of our minds, my friends, our understanding the truth of God through His Word. My friends, this is God's complete message. This is the inspired word of God, amen? amen? God directed and oversaw the human authors, utilizing their unique personalities so that they composed his complete message down to the very word and very text. Inspired word. And so what the Apostle Paul is referring to when he says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds, my friends, is to know the word of God. And we're being transformed by the renewal of our minds so that we put off what does not match and we put on what does match. Let's keep going. Look at verse 24. Now insert the phrase again. And you were discipled to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. All right. Not that we're doing sword drills today, but we need to flip back to Genesis chapter 1. All the way at the beginning of your Bible. Feel free to turn there with me. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, comparing like Bible passages. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. My friends, when God created Adam and Eve, He created them in His own image. Now, does God have arms and legs and a head? No. God is spirit. He's everywhere present in time and space. And so, my friends, when it refers to, and the Latin is imagio Deo, the image of God, imagio Deo. When we talk about imagio Deo, what we're referring to is the spirit, the eternal part of you and of me. Help me to be a better Christian tomorrow. Now, what do we really mean there? Have we ever said, oh, I'm, just, I'm trying so hard. I'm, I'm trying so hard to be better. You know what? As long as we continue to try harder, we will continue to fail harder, my friends. Because you see, that's will worship. You cannot will yourself into the likeness of God. You cannot will yourself into that. You have to surrender to the Spirit and let Him do it. Only God can do it. Remember John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. My friends, putting on the new self requires that you and I surrender control to the Holy Spirit. As we, can, as we continue this life and we can, as we continue to get stuck in a rut, fall down in those ruts, my friends, how do we get up out of the ruts? How do we get up out of the mud? It's 
It's by surrender. And most sermons would stop here and say, so surrender. But I won't leave you hanging. I'll give you the how. Because we need the how. How do we do that? How do, how do we surrender control to the Spirit? Well, the first thing is, you know, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You need to be a believer first. You need to be indwelled with the Spirit. You need to have that new nature. You need to be a regenerate being. John 3.3 says that. In order to enter the kingdom, you must be born and then you must be born again. First and foremost, the only way we can put on the new self is to have a new self to put on. Got to be a believer. But it doesn't stop there, my friends. The next thing we need to do is we need to understand what it means to agree with God that we've messed up. Now, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, is it required that we, that we confess our sin or we don't get forgiven? No, because that's the second half of this comparison. It says, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's this comparison contrast of the heart of a believer and a heart of an unbeliever. Heart of a believer is automatically going to agree with God we messed up. The key is to agree earlier and sooner and more often, my friends. Confess early, confess often. It's like any relationship. If, if one of my sons does something that is displeasing to me, I might send them to their room to think over things. And while they're in their room, we're at enmity, en enmity between each other. We, we have something between us. We're out of fellowship. Now, that doesn't mean that they stop being my son. They're still my son. They'll always be my son. I'll always love them no matter what. But as long as they're up there, they're, we're at enmity between each other. And until they come out of the room, until they look me in the eye and say, Dad, I was wrong. I'm sorry. We will be out of fellowship. And so, my friends, as long as we carry this gunny sack of things that we know that we've infringed on God with, we'll be out of fellowship with Him. Now, there's certain kind of things that we, that we will do to hurt God's heart. And, of course, are we forgiven for them? We're going to talk about that in a second. Of course we are. But we need to agree with God and we need to turn away from walking that way and living that lifestyle to put on the new self. So the first step is to agree with God that we've messed up. Now, there's sins of omission, things you've left out. We were, we, as a believer, we should have done this. Shoulda, 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 but we didn't. Sins of omission. Then there are the most overt ones and sins of commission, things that we did that we know good and well we should not have done, but we did not Then there are the little bit more slippery ones. There are sins of wrong motive. You know, we can do the right thing, but if we do it with the wrong motive in mind, that's still sin. I'll give you an example. You know, suppose I help someone out. Suppose I really bail someone out in a very big pinch. And maybe it was a big deal for me to do that. And they say, oh, thank you so much, thank you. And I just go, yeah, that was good of me, wasn't it? That's a wrong motive. Because, see, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Glory to God for what He did, and glory to God for what He did in you and through you. Amen? Amen. Wrong motives. And then there's the last one, the trickiest one of all, wrong attitude. And if we're being honest, we're, every one of us is guilty of carrying a gunny sack of wrong attitudes around with us. And it will destroy us. It will destroy the unity. It will destroy everything that we are. And you know what? It eats the person alive. Wrong attitudes. And it could be just simply, a, you know, some, some, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're just angry with that person. Or that, that person at work. Or that, other, that person who always, every time you see them, they're... Whatever that is, well, we need to let that go, my friends. We need, to, we need to love them in spite of themselves. Amen? Because as the Apostle Paul says, you know, if they're the unbeliever, they can't help it. We need to have empathy for the fact they can't help it. Let those unloving attitudes go and love the way Jesus Christ loved unconditionally. Love is unconditional. Love does not take into account the wrong suffered. And if you're holding on to your anger with someone, let it go. Let it go. 
Confess your sin. That's, that's step one. If you're a believer, confess that sin. Get it out there. Agree with God. You messed up and move on. Remembering and counting on the forgiveness. Because you see, my friends, you and I, sometimes we say, oh, I don't know about that one. That's pretty bad. And we haven't forgiven ourselves. We haven't forgiven ourselves. But Psalms 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. You are forgiven. Even that, you're forgiven. Even that. Amen. Really? Even that? Yeah, even that. <laughs> How dare we think God's not powerful to forgive you for that one too? How dare us? You've got to forgive yourself. You've got to remember that you're forgiven and count on that forgiveness. But it doesn't stop there. Ephesians 5.18 reminds us that we need to be controlled by the Spirit. And it gives this comparison contrast. You know, we Baptists beat on the first half of that. Be not drunk with wine, which leads to dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. It's a comparison contrast. The effects of alcohol goes right down to your very ends of your finger. You can sense that. It affects your speech. It affects your thought processes. It affects the way you live. It affects everything that you do. In other words, what it says is, just like that influences, don't be influenced by that. Instead, be controlled by the Spirit. Let the Spirit control you. Now, that's written in the imperative mood. That is a command. You believe that if, if the Bible commands you to do something, you can do it. Because you see, it's also written in present and perfect tense for you English majors. What that means is, that it is a perpetual act. In other words, what it should say in translation is be being filled with the Spirit all the time. We are commanded to be controlled by the Spirit all the time as believers. That's a tough one. You say, wow, man, I can't be controlled by You know, at times that you've been controlled by the Spirit because your response to that situation was not you. You looked at that and you said, man, normally I would have just blown up at that for that. Or normally I would have, wow, that, that's not like me. <laughs> no, it was like the Spirit, because you were, you were controlled by the Spirit. Well, let me give you some hope here, because you see the last, the last component of this is you need to count on that control of the Spirit. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 promises us this, and here's what it says. It says, if we ask anything according to His will, it's His will for you to be controlled by the Spirit all the time. He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked Him. Lord, fill me with Your Spirit. Confess, count on the forgiveness, surrender control of the Spirit, and count on the control of the Spirit perpetually, all the time. This is how I am you my friends. Because you see, as you and I are continually more often controlled by the Spirit, and His responses become your responses, and my responses, we are able to fulfill this putting on the new self because the Spirit is doing it through us. Count on the control of the Spirit always. Confess, count on the forgiveness, surrender control, and count on the control. Remember that. Let's pray.